Good morning, everyone, and welcome one more time. My name is Len Dumas, Executive Director for the Northern California Section of the PJ of America. And on behalf of our colleagues, Nikki Gatch, Executive Director for the Southern California PGA, our Section Presidents, Eric Lippert and Eric Lohman. Uh, it's the reign of Eric's here in California and our on-air team, Steve Monday, Bryce Siever and Shelby Zell. Welcome to the California Nevada chat here on uh, actually wonderfully a sunny uh, St. Patrick's Day, March 17th, 2023. So we are between storms of what has been just an incredible California winter. We hope that everyone is faring well, both professionally and personally in their homes and their facilities. Please do the best you can to take care. Uh, we always look out for each other. And uh, let's hope we remain safe through these storms because from what we understand, they're not done. Our guest today, we have Mike Wan, CEO of the United States Golf Association, Jeremy Friedman, Director of Public Relations and Marketing for Outlier, uh, the Global Event Management and Sponsorship Consulting Agency, and Craig Kessler, Director of Public Affairs for the Southern California Golf Association. First, uh, some words from our colleagues and uh, ladies and gentlemen, Nikki Gatch, Executive Director for the Southern California PGA. Nikki? Thank you, Lynn. I'll just say a quick good morning to everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, happy St. Patrick's Day to everyone. Uh, Mr. Juan, Mr. Friedman, and Mr. Kessler, thank you all for joining us today. Thanks, Lynn. Yeah, thanks, Nikki. And our, our section president, Eric Lippert. Eric? Great. Thank you, Lynn. And uh, again, good morning to everybody. Thanks for being on. What a great... Uh, these chats have been fantastic, and uh, they, they always deliver with some great information. Um, obviously, Mr. Friedman, Mr. Juan, and Mr. Kessler, we're going to have another great session. Very exciting to hear some of the things from Mike and what he has for us today as well. But um, yeah, stay safe out there. That's the other message, right? Because yeah. it seems like uh, at almost that calm before the storm again. But uh, it is nice to see the sun shining. Hopefully, everybody can enjoy a nice day and some good weekend. Get a little time to themselves outside again because everybody needs a little bit of that. So, uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Len. Thank you very much, though. Yeah, thank you, Eric. And uh, to Mike, Jeremy, Craig, thank you for joining us. We know how busy each of you are. We really appreciate you taking some time to talk to our members, associates, and partners uh, here in California and Nevada. Uh, Mike, if you, we'll, we'll start with you. You've had an incredible career in marketing and leadership success with uh, Procter & Gamble, Wilson Sporting Goods, TaylorMade, and Mission iTech Hockey, and hockey as well. So at what point... Mike, with all of that, at what point did did the golf bug just bite you and say, that's really what I want to do? You know, uh, you know I was a kid who grew up, they called me a bunker boy. When I was a kid, you had to uh, edge the bunkers, break the bunkers, put in drainage. If you could make it through one summer as a bunker boy, uh, the deal was the next summer they teach you how to use the riding apparatus. And when you're 13, the idea of riding something that wasn't on rails is pretty awesome. So yeah. I worked on a golf course on the grounds crew until the day I graduated college. A lot of times still dressed in whatever I went out with the night before. I've changed my share hole locations, still wearing the same thing I wore to the bars in college. But um, uh, so like most young kids, the whole time thinking, man, when I get an education, I'll never be out here again. You know, not realizing you're actually building your career. You just didn't know you were building your career. So after a nice run at Procter & Gamble, I was the Crest Toothpaste brand manager. So if we want to break off and talk tartar control and gum health, I'm very comfortable there. But um, I got a call from a recruiter, like some people do. Wilson Sporting Goods was looking for a head of their golf ball and golf glove business. From there, I went to TaylorMade. TaylorMade got bought by Adidas. Um, you know, I ran a hockey equipment company. And it's funny, when I left TaylorMade Adidas, I told both them and my wife that this has been incredible. I really enjoyed the experience in golf. But I felt the learning curve was kind of flattening. We had a great run at TaylorMade as back in the 90s was an amazing time to be there. But I didn't, but I thought I'd sort of learned what I came to learn. And, you know, be careful when you say something out loud, especially to your spouse, because, you know, uh, 10 years later, after we sold the, the hockey equipment company, I got a call from a recruiter who was looking for the LPGA commissioner job. It was, by the way, it was about a month after I'd taken my wife to dinner. And after a couple of quality bottles of red wine, I'd made her three promises. Number one, I was never going to make her leave California. We lived in Cota de Casa, so Southern Cal. And I said, we'll never leave Cota de Casa. This is where you want to raise your kids. Number two, I'm going to take a year off of work. I'm going to pick up the kids at the pickup line. I'm going to volunteer for fifth grade. I'm going to coach Little League. All the things you say real husbands should do, and I don't. And then I said to her, whatever, I just had back surgery. I was about 39. And I said, uh, because flying is really hurting my back, whatever job I take next, I promise you it won't require as much travel as my previous jobs. And 
So then I became the LPGA commissioner. We moved to Orlando and I fly 52 weeks a year. So um, I don't know if I'm a very good commissioner, but I'm a horrendous husband. I think the toughest one of those commitments, Mike, was the volunteering to help out in fifth grade. That's really going above and beyond. You know. So, Mike, Mike, we get you at, a, at an amazing time, right? At an amazing time, basically 72 hours after the pronouncement for the model local rule comes out. So, as we discussed before we came on the air, let, let's talk about that a bit. Mike, that was deep. This is, it's not a new conversation. It's been around for a long, long time. And certainly uh, was there when you joined the USJ in July of 2021. So, Mike, where where was it on the to do list when you stepped into your current position? Yeah, if I was being honest with you, Len, I had a I had more than my share of peers, both in the industry and out, saying you're going to go be the head of the USJ now. Like, what are you thinking? Like, let them do whatever they're going to do, and let somebody else get beat up, um, and then go join the USGA. Um, but, you know, I'm sort of a glutton for punishment. I joined TaylorMade when it was uh, just laid off. A third of its staff was losing to this new company called Callaway down the street, which is weird. If anybody in the audience is under 40, you probably think I made that up, but it was true. Um, I mean, you know, I went to the LPJ right when all the articles said the LPJ was going was gonna to go away forever. It was going into recession, just lost about 40% of their tournaments had gone away. So I, I kind of like walking in when things are unclear. It, um, it gives you real sense of purpose. So um, I've said this many times, I've certainly said this a million times this week in a lot of different interviews. Um, I have really enjoyed the dialogue process in my first two years here about this topic. And I only I always say when I start the de debate with any, with any person sitting next to me on a plane or sitting next to me in a meeting, um, I will have a realistic conversation about distance with anybody as long as two things are true. As long as you can admit out loud that um, distance hasn't slowed down in the last 60 years and certainly not, not even in the last 10 to 20. And there's no reason to think it's going to for the next 10 to 20. Anybody who tells me like this is as far as we're going to go, hasn't been to a junior speed training or a junior amateur, or just, you know, the reality of it is that distance is going to keep going. And that's okay. I mean, quite frankly, it's a fun part of the game. But if you can agree that that's going to happen, and if you tell me you're not conflicted by a current manufacturing deal, um, then we can have a real good conversation about, uh, about solutions. So when I got here, I was really a, a big proponent in the solutions we recommended a year ago, which is a ball that would um, that would be tested at 125 miles an hour, not 120. Probably have about eight yards of impact on the average amateur, and maybe you know 13 yards of impact on the average tour player. And then a, a golf club that would have a smaller sweet spot and less face rebound, and make that essentially for elite golf. Both of those felt really rational. We went out with a, a year ago with a, an area of interest, just like we did here this week. And in the process of the next six months of listening. The overwhelming number one feedback was, um, if you got to do something about distance, do it where distance is a concern. There's no, con you know, my amateurs on this course are not obsoleting any fairway bunkers anytime soon. And we wouldn't build longer just for the, for the membership. We build longer for hosting things. So that was pretty consistent. Even tour players, in fairness, were, were saying at the top of their list. So, so when we kind of came back with a change on the golf ball, we made it a model local rule so you could implement it um, just at competitions where you felt it was necessary and just when you feel it's necessary. And then on the golf club side, what we learned through research is to make a meaningful difference in the size of the sweet spot, you have to go so small that you would actually have to make a change on three woods, five woods, hybrid clubs. And um, while that might be realistic to service maybe the PGA Tour, no other tour in the world could be serviced on six different clubs in their bag every day. Nobody at a local PGA could ever implement a, how would you know somebody's size of sweet spot if you wanted to implement it in a sectional. So from those two pieces of feedback, focus on elite, not re recreational. And on the club thing, if it's more than one club and it's not easy to understand locally. So we've kind of backed off on the club, at least for now. We're actually a little bit more focused in the, in the next era on how much face um, creep happens. You know, a club is approved when we test it out of the box, but four months later, it's, um, and, and that's not just a problem in terms of our concern. Even tour players are coming to us and going, I've hit this for three months and now I don't know. Can you can you test it? People want to know what they're playing is, is okay. So so the, this MLR ball concept is essentially saying, why don't we offer uh, solutions to distance long-term where, where, where distance could really be a problem? And I think for the people that say, what's wrong with the game? Everything's great. I'm not here to argue with any of those people. But I also think you have to say, if elite driving distance is 30 yards longer or more, because we're averaging about a, a, a yard 0.3 now, but you know, even if we only averaged a yard, in 30 years, the average elite driving distance is 30 yards longer. Um, any club that wants to host anything from 
corn ferry to reach sectionals to you know to anything that elite competition um, they're going to have to make significant investments and we're seeing it all across the U.S. We're seeing these huge investments and when they finish I just saw it on a road down the road you know they got 100 yards back on every tee box they'll never use it except in 2029 when they're hosting a championship but they're watering it the nutrients it's uh, that that cost is getting passed on so um, I've said many times no matter what we come out with. 90% of the people aren't going to like it. And that's, that's governance. You know, that's, that's reality. Uh, but the only solution that's unacceptable is no solution. I, I've said, uh, we're going to do all we can to make sure that every part of the game stays a great part of the game. But I'm 58 years old, so I'm too old and too belligerent to, uh, to leave this game worse for my kids' kids. It's the only reason I took the job at the USGA is this game has been, as, I, as we described in my resume, this game has literally been a life changer for me. Virtually everybody that I love in my life kind of came through and is part of the game. So uh, I didn't do this job to piss off Justin Thomas. I didn't do this job to challenge Seth Waugh. I did this job because I want to make sure that in 2050, we're still talking about a great game. I've, I've watched great booms happen in golf before and then go away. We're in the middle of another one. And, and when you're in a great boom, you ask yourself, what wouldn't make it great in 20 or 25 years and make some choices on those on those now? So I fully expect it to be tedious. I fully expect the people to be, and I don't expect a 25-year-old in the prime of their tour career to be focused on 25 years from now. I get that. But if I, if I show you how many emails I got today from 40 to 60-year-old tour professionals, uh, you'd be shocked at the number of people saying, stick to your guns, hang in there. We've all known this. Everybody knows it. They just don't want to deal with it. And if there's one fair critique of the USJ and the RNA, and I've said this, and I mean this on us, is... Where were you 10 or 12 years ago? You know, we did it. We made a change in 76. We made a change in 86. We made a change in 2004. And then we went away for 20 years. And uh, I think sometimes the fear of this negative feedback will make you, will paralyze you. But maybe, like I said, being old and belligerent, you know, I'm, to me, I'm, I'm not going to just sit around for another 20 years and then just hope our kids figure out the situation we left them. Mike, thank you for that. And, and a couple of points in there. One, you know, the Masters is just a couple of weeks away. And to that point, as we know, the 13th hole, the tee was moved back on the 13th hole to help uh, combat that distance issue. And then part two, the power of the public comment period. As you mentioned, during the comment period when you joined the USGA, that was a key factor in the move from everyone that's playing to just the elite players and the elite competitions. And we are in a current uh, a public comment period uh, in mid-August. And Mike, when we talked about, and you start, you, you answered it to some extent, you know, the, the yardage itself, it seems as though the testing right now is that this is a rollback of about 14 to 15 yards, you know, at the elite level, at the JT level, and so on and so forth. Was that the goal or what, or was it, let's work on the science and see where it takes us? Well, there was two, there was two goals, Len, from the very beginning when we started implementing real ball distance control uh, regimens all the way back to 76. We've always used what we thought represented the top 1% of club head speed. So this will sound really strange, but for those of you as old as me, back then it was 109 miles an hour. And that was the top 1% of elite players club head speed. Um, when we changed it in 2004, we moved, and so I'm jumping up a few changes. We changed it to 2004, we moved it to 120. At the time, there was only about four people swinging 120. And the thought was, and the funny thing was going back and reading some of the data, that the thought was both at the RNA and the USGA is we'll move it to this and distance will be essentially stopped forever. You know, I mean, like, man, that'll do it, you know, not realizing that athleticism and swing training and strength and height the kids is, is never going to slow down. And, and quite frankly, it shouldn't. No different than four minute mile was seemed inconceivable. And now it's, you know, now it can happen at a lot of meet. So, um, and I've said from the beginning, the last thing that any of us wants to do is take distance away from the athlete. Like if you can work hard, figure out how to control length and make that a competitive advantage. We want that to be a competitive advantage. And if you can be longer than somebody else, more power to you. So by, by going all the way out to the longest level on testing, what it essentially says is if you can swing it that fast and most can't, then that ball is going to kind of be going to, going to kind of fall at a certain level, but quite frankly, 99% of the people, even on the tour can't. And so it'll have a lesser impact for them. So if you can swing at 127, you probably have an 18 yard impact. And if you can swing at 123, you probably have a, or 120, you probably have a 14 yard impact. So it'll be slightly different depending on how much club head speed. So one, we wanted to replicate the top end of speed because that's consistent what we've done for 50 years. But I think more important to that, Len, what I've said to this group from the beginning is, 
if we implement change, and not just talking about tour players or PJ tour players, any, any tour player, any, any amateur, any elite level mid amateur, if you ask somebody to adjust their game into a ball, um, that sucks. They won't like it, but they'll do it because they're elite. But what we want to do is make that change and then get out of the way for as long as we possibly can. So when somebody says to me, including a tour player who called me last night, why don't you just change it to 123? And then it'll have like, you know, six yards of impact. And I said, well, based on the current rate of increase that you guys are experiencing, you'll probably have made up that six yards by the time it gets implemented. And then over the next 10 yards, 10 years, like it'll be, why didn't we even mess with it? So if we moved it to 123, then four years later, we'd move it to 125. And then four years later, we'd, and so what, what I've sort of said is I'd like the least amount of interruption. I'd like to make a change and then get out of the way for 15 years. So in my mind, if we made this, uh, if we made this MLR broad scale use, I don't think we'd come back and look at it again for 15 years. And I, by the way, I think in 15 years, we'd be right back to the place we are right now in terms of elite distance. And that's okay. Um, at least we wouldn't be 25 yards longer than we are right now because there's, you know, there's some places that have the money and the resources and the backing and the members to just keep powering in another $12 million every 10 years. And there's some places that can't. They, they're landlocked. It's, and even the places that you all represent, even if you could, is it even going to be acceptable from a government and, you know, community perspective? It's just because you can, should you? And if we just have to water more, we'll get over it. I mean, you talk to somebody in Florida and New Jersey, they don't really care about grabbing more land and throwing more water on it. Talk to somebody in Vegas and Tucson, it's a slightly different answer. So again, I'm not expecting everybody in the world to care, um, but I would um, I would say that's what the RNA and the USJ's role is, is to care about the game 30 years from now, so that the people that have memberships and associations and they have to deliver to those members right now can focus on that so that we can focus on something a little longer term. So Mike, you know, two very important points, particularly here for us in, in California and Nevada is, is land and water. So, and as we'll, we'll hear that from Craig later on. So Mike, uh, process wise, right, they were in the common period till about mid August. And at the moment, again, based upon what I've read, looks like implementation is January of 2026. And uh, also that perhaps should this all get through or whatever form it gets through, the starting point would be the U.S. Open and the U.S. Amateur. So uh, most mostly correct. So yes, we're going to have a feedback through mid-August. Um, our goal right now would be to announce whatever final change we're going to be would be in January 24. And we've typically wanted to always give manufacturers, tours, players, PGA, two years between announcement and time, mostly because you know manufacturers need time to, to make an adjustment if there is one as well. Um, and if we if we made a January 24 for a January 26 implementation, it would be available for implementation on January 1 of 2026. Okay, great. Mike, thank you for all of that. And, and we do want to spend some time. We've got a, a couple of big events coming up uh, here in California. We're only about 60 days away. And that is uh, maybe a little more, maybe 90 days away. We have the Men's Open headed to LACC. And then about a little over a month after that, we have the uh, Women's Open right here at Pebble Beach. So my congratulations on that and, and talk about those great events at two great facilities. Yeah, plus we'll have the Women's Amateur and the Senior Am in California. So my frequent flyer points will go through the roof in the next <laughs> 12 months. Uh, but, you know, being a Southern California guy and uh, spending a little bit of time in Danville, I don't have any problem with, uh, with heading back to California. It's the one place when I tell my wife I'm going where I see her start to pack. So... I know how she feels about California. Uh, but yeah, I mean, to me, bringing the uh, the US Open to LACC, I mean, I was I lived in California long enough to drive by LACC gates and think, I wonder what it's like in there. And then a couple of times showed up in my shorts and reminded that uh, maybe you should put some pants on. Um, the uh, it's just it's just a special it's you know, we talk about cathedrals of the game and LACC is a cathedral and it's uh, it deserves to be shown. We played a Walker Cup there not too long ago. And after playing that Walker Cup, both us and LACC leadership said, it's time. You know, I mean, we weren't sure, given the location and the tightness and the, and the challenges of whether it was right for them. And I, I, wouldn't, I think at the time they weren't sure. But after living through the Walker Cup, both sides said, let's, let's figure this out. It will be the, um, it will probably be one of the smaller footprints in U.S. Open history, meaning the number of people we can get on that property, both from a standpoint of pinch points on the property and just getting there. So uh, kind of like Boston was last year, 
Uh, it will feel like a ton of people, but it's probably half as many as you'd see in Pinehurst the next year, just in terms of space and parking and, and availability. Uh, it'll also probably be the highest percentage of, uh, of VIP tickets per ticket sold. I mean, it's uh, because it's uh, it's it's such a sought after ticket. People want to not just come, but they you know, but they want to be there, be part of the party, you know, have their own you know corporate and, and association access. If, if there's a part of the LACC that's a physical structure that isn't already sold to somebody, I don't know what it is. Uh, the pro shop was sort of the last to go, so. It's uh, it's going to be fun. It's going to be uh, it's going to be tight. And like Boston was last year, we said to people who, and luckily Southern Californians know it. Um, the good news is, when we, last year in Boston, we had to acquire a ton of parking property all over the place, and we were more worried about getting people from the parking place to the golf course because it was just church lots all over Boston. In the case of uh, LA, most I would say seventy five or eighty percent of the parking structures that we'll use will be walkable to the course. So you got to get to them. And that's an LA challenge, no matter what day you're at. But um, whether it's Century City Mall or, or, or right next door, most people will park in and actually, you know, not even necessarily need a shuttle per se to get to the course. So um, like all Southern Californians are used to uh, schedule time for driving. But I think the good news is post parking, it's a pretty fun, uh, pretty fun experience. And it's a uh, it's just going to be fun to showcase that facility to the world. And then, you know, for the women to be able to come to Pebble for their first time in the U.S. Women's Open, I mean, um, I'm sure that, uh, I'm sure Eric's hearing it, but as a former LPGA commissioner, I've probably heard from 100 players on tour, including some that between us were planning on retiring. And uh, and as as one player said to me, damn it, Kamish, I can't stop until we get to Pebble. You know, so it's, um, that tells you what Pebble means to them. And it's, uh, uh, I've said this many times, when you look at the women's lineup over the next 15 years, some of which we've announced and some of which we haven't, I would argue that the women's U.S. Open lineup is as good as any lineup in the world, men's, women's, majors, regular. I mean, we're talking, you know, we're talking best of the best, and it's really going to be cool as a former LPJ commissioner to, because I have zero concern about their ability on, on these courses and uh, what it means to them to be able to put, to, to stamp some female history on top of it a lot of places what's been a lot of male history is really um really good for the game uh it's good for me emotionally because i feel so strong about that group and it's good for young girls that i mean i can promise you there's no way you're going to watch um prime time by the way nbc tv from pebble on saturday and sunday night and there won't be a ton of nine-year-old girls changing their dream that's just that's just special stuff I think it really is, and it's a start uh, as well, as you mentioned, and uh, a little bit of trivia might come up at a party, who knows, but as Pebble has to some extent, as Pebble has to some extent become an anchor site, you know, for so many USGA events, um, on the on the championship wall behind the first tee, as I mentioned earlier, you can look at the schedule of events to come, and I think about the fourth U.S. Women's Open from now, or fifth, is in 2048, so nice job on the Scheduling. I hope somebody you say that. I, mean, I was I was on a panel one time with Seth, and he looked at me and goes, "What's up with scheduling in 1946?" You know, and uh, so I'll tell you guys a little something that I don't talk to the media a lot about. But one of the things that caught me off guard when I got here is, you know, we go play a championship like at the Country Club in Boston, and then when it's all over, and you guys do the same thing with the PGA Championship or the Ryder Cup, it's all over. You grab the key leaders of the membership, and two months later, you have a debrief and you walk through. What worked? What didn't work? If we had to do it over again, what would we have changed? And then we all go home. And then about 12 years later, the USGA rolls in town, brand new leadership team at the country club, brand new leadership team at the USGA, and they, and they start building a new country club championship with none of the learning from the past. No changes have been made because nobody can go back to their membership and say, you know, if we just paved that TV area, they might come back in 22 years. So the whole goal of these, and, and meanwhile, I go to Augusta every year and see every year they can look at something and say, gosh, that could be better. And they can just fix it because they know we're coming back next year. So the idea for us with anchor sites is to be able to sit down with people like Eric at, at Pebble Beach and say, you know, every year we come, we build this tent for all the players' locker rooms. And it's about a million two to build that tent. And then we leave, we take down the million two tent and we come back six years later, we build a million two tent. What if we built a structure together? that would stay there long-term that you could use for all your PGA tour events. You could use it for all your other charitable foundation outings. But if it cost us 4 million to build that tent, we pay it off in three tournaments, but because we don't tell you we're coming back, nobody can make 
those investments together. Or in the case of Pebble, you know, letting us work with like Del Monte Country Club to work on some of our water retention issues is something that comes out of this. We really want to figure out if some of our research that happens in a in a in a in a university is true in real life, whether it's drip irrigation or GPS spraying or the things we push on courses, we got to make sure it works. So when we find these kind of things, we have it with Pebble, we have it with Pioneers, we have it with Oakmont. We're now making real investments together in things that will make Oakmont a better U.S. Open forever. Um, adding bridges over roads that where people were dangered before, and Pebble building full-time structures. So it might seem a little strange when you're reading our press release and said they're going to Oakland Hills in 1951. That's interesting. Now, in both cases, Oakland Hills could get out of it, and so could we if things are different in 1951. But given that we're both committed to it, we can start making real choices together with their members and their management on things that are only that are better for them right now and be really good for us when we come. And so it was a disadvantage of a rotating major that we're trying to make go away a little bit. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. And and uh, this might be the toughest one you handled today uh, from our, our own uh, PGA members and such, which is the access to the Opens, uh, to the Men's the Open. US, the Women's and Men's Open? Correct, right. Um, are, you, are you not aware of that already? Would uh, I be telling you this for the first time? I, I, some clarification would be great. Okay. All right, I got. I took. Uh, I took Seth through this back at the uh, PGA show, um, and I was thinking it was posted. But uh, so uh, let's do them. Uh, let's do them in that order. So at the U.S. Open, what I've told Seth and your board. Uh, maybe I didn't tell the board. What I've told Seth is um, limited, uh, limited space tracks like Boston last year, LA this year, where we really are tight. A Marion. Um, our PGA deal will be. Free ticket, any practice round you want to come, come up, show your show your uh, membership identification and your ID. Uh, just like any other USGA event, you, you get into that event. On the we on the on the tournament days, Thursday through Sunday, um, we're going to have a hundred a uh, hundred PGA uh, access limit. And in that case, it's a it's a process. And if you don't have it, I'll mail it to you afterwards. Where you essentially go online and you and you put yourself on that list. Um, the, the problem with these small footprints is if uh, 2,000 of you show up on Sunday, we got real problems given the, how we're trying to manage this small footprint. If I'm being honest with you, and I probably shouldn't say this to this whole group, what I've told my team is 100 person limit, but until it gets to about 160, don't stress. But when we get about 160 or more, we're probably going to. Um, and on the U.S. Open, it's just a ticket for you in terms of in terms of getting in. But if you really want to go Thursday through Sunday, um, I'm pretty sure it's on the PGA Dot com site, but if not, I'll send you Len and Nikki a follow up email, which kind of lays out how to how to put yourself on that list, and you'll know right away whether you're a part of that that hundred. At the U.S. Women's Open, would be more like our larger footprint U.S. Opens. You can come any day, and you could bring a guest with your ID and your and your membership uh, your membership identification. So uh, whether that's practice round or tournament play round, so that would be more like Pinehurst. Or Oakmont, where you know we don't uh, we don't set a limit, but in these limited fields, like we're gonna have twenty two thousand people a day at LA, where we might have forty eight thousand at Pinehurst or or at Oakmont. So that's that's why, and um, doesn't include parking. So if you're say to me, you know that doesn't help me, well, yeah, you're gonna have to go find parking, but um, that makes you makes you like others. But it's um, that's what that's what LA and Pebble will entail. Uh, we did this last year. I don't know if you remember this. We did this last year, and I, I and then I said to Seth, "Tell you what, let's get rid of it, and let's just see how many people come to it." Because Boston, like LA, was a place we hadn't been in a long time. Huge pent up demand, and um, on the weekend, Saturday and Sunday, without a limit, we had fifty five on Saturday and fifty four on Sunday. So I don't really think it's um, but by but 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 setting it's going to be key because if we're wrong and twenty six hundred folks show up from all around, we got we got real problems relative to parking, food, access points, bridges. So so that's the idea. Hope that's clear. But Nikki and Len, if you want, shoot me an email afterwards and I'll reply back. I'm I'm sure I have a one pager that I shared with Seth that I'm happy to share with you guys just so it's very clear. Great. It's it's posted on pga.org now. Um, okay. I don't think a, a separate email has been sent, but that should be coming. And I believe the, the registration process opens on May 1. Okay, well, you know more than I do then. So, but if you need something for me as a follow-up, just just ask and I'll make sure we get you something. Thank you. Sorry if that hadn't made it to you guys earlier than that. You know, Mike, thank you. Uh, you thank you so much for your time. Again, congratulations. Uh, you know, with your time with the LPGA, what you've done there, and certainly now with the USGA, 
uh, including us and, you know, out here in the West and so much of what's happening and continued success. And we'll, we'll continue to stay, stay close and support each other. So thank you, Mike. I don't think I've, I don't think I've ever said this to a group of Californians because it just doesn't yeah. ring true, but good luck with your weather. That's really weird <laughs> to come out of my mouth. Yeah. Um, but good luck with your weather. I know it's been I know it's been a rough uh, rough spring. Hopefully, we're filling some coffers up of of some water. I know for two courses, Eric and I, and and for folks at LACC, we're um, we didn't expect this. And as a group that likes a lot of rough and uh, and a firm fast fairway, uh, two things are happening. You know, we're hard to get the kind of weather for it. But um, but really appreciate you guys being part of this. As a Californian, um, I'm really proud. As, as when I was out at um, when I was in the peninsula last summer. I was there with Martin Slumbers. I think it was his first time at Cypress Point. And I said, Martin, welcome to America, Scotland, because this is the land God gave us. And um, we've turned it into some of the best golf in the world. And he said, uh, well, it's not Scotland. I said, nope, it's a little better. And so, I mean, I, I love California and I'm, I'm proud to be a Californian. Thanks to all of you that are watching and all of you that I can see uh, for what you do for the game. It, it matters and more important, it's gonna matter for our kids who get to hopefully follow in our footsteps one day. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. You're, you're part of that growth. So we appreciate that and hope you're able to stay with us. Of course, understand you may have to run uh, at the same time. Yeah, I'm going to pop off. I'd rather be with you than what I'm about to go to. My next interview may not be as fun, but uh, thank you guys for letting me join. Thank, thank you, Mike. Mike. Thanks, Mike. Cheers. Okay, on, on to uh, Jeremy. Thanks for being with us and uh, much appreciated. And I'm going to uh, turn it over to Nikki. Nikki? Thanks, Len. Uh, Jeremy, welcome. Jeremy Friedman is the Vice President of Public Relations for Outlier, uh, which, as Len mentioned earlier, is a global event management sponsorship consulting agency, um, specializes in uh, development execution of, of events, um, PGA Tour events, LPGA Tour events, Corn Ferry, and collegiate events. Uh, we'll, we'll dive into uh, the couple of events we're going to talk about here in the Los Angeles area. Uh, prior to joining Outlier, Jeremy spent 14 years at Golf Channel and NBC Sports, and, and he mentioned to me this morning that he worked alongside Mike, so pretty cool that we uh, we somehow arranged to have both of you on uh, on the same day, so thanks for that. Um, prior to the Golf Channel, um, free, uh, Jeremy worked in uh, New York for another sports marketing agency, um, handling uh, the events for Buick, so all the Buick-sponsored uh, PJ Tour events, um, the old Buick scramble, as we all remember. Um, so that, that's great there. Jeremy's a, a, a dog. He's a graduate of the University of Georgia, and he's also a member of the I alumni am. board of directors uh, for the Georgia's Journalism uh, School, Grady College. Uh, and he's coming to us today from Tampa, Florida. Jeremy, thanks for joining us today. Um, we've had the, the privilege of working alongside you, um, you know, the last few years with uh, the LPGA events that are that have been here in the Los Angeles area. You know, last year we had three. Um, this year we have two. Uh, we've got the, the these these two events are, are a mouthful. We've got the DIO Implant LA Open. Uh, that's the first one on the docket later this month, uh, March 30th to April 2nd at Palos Verdes Golf Club, home of our Southern California PGA Golf Professional of the Year, Jim Gormley. And then the following month, uh, the JM Eagle LA Championship presented by PlastPro. That'll be held at Wilshire Country Club uh, the last week of April. So thanks for joining us. I'll, I'll let you decide if you want to talk about um, Outlier, who Outlier is, and and how that came about, and then we can dive into the to the two events. Yeah, thank you, Nikki, um, and uh, good morning, uh, everybody uh, out uh, out west. Uh, as Nikki said, I am I am in Tampa, Florida, so I am uh, out east. So it's good afternoon for me. Um, as Nikki mentioned, yeah, so I'm uh, I'm VP of uh, PR and communications for Outlier. So we operate. Uh, 11, uh, 11 golf tournaments. So eight on the LPGA tour, uh, a PGA tour champions event, the Chubb classic that just happened in Naples, a new corn Ferry tour event that's in New Jersey and a college event in Arkansas. Um, I joined here, uh, managing the company's, uh, PR media relations a couple of years ago after coming from, from golf channel on NBC. And, uh, as Nikki mentioned, I worked alongside Mike, uh, for a lot of years when I was at Golf Channel NBC because I was the LPGA's kind of PR and communications liaison uh, for Golf Channel NBC Sports. So worked closely with with Mike and and his team, the marketing communications team for for a lot of events on the LPGA tour. So the 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 beauty of uh, for for me when I came over here to uh, 
uh, to Outlier and in managing PR for them was a lot of these tournaments that we run, I covered them for, for Golf Channel on NBC. So I was on site as a member of the media. So now I am running the media centers and running the, running the press operations and, and all that. So I'm taking a, and I, I've told this to a lot of folks that I'm taking all of my years being a TV and media PR guy and putting it into uh, into what what we do now at our tournaments is running the media center operations and, and press operations. I, 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 I stress this all the time that what we do um, in the media side, we're the front of the house to the rest of the world. And the the the, the media center and, and the press and the, and the PR side, um, I, I'm, I'm bullish about it being a priority because if you don't take care of your don't take care of your your members of the media, good food, good internet, good parking, good coffee, um, then, you know, you take care of those four things, you're, you're well on your way. So, uh, so that's a little bit about, uh, about outlier. We are, or, or what, what I am, what, uh, what outlier is. So it's, it's a new name for, for an existing, a couple of agencies that merged together uh, a couple of years ago. So Iger marketing group and then octagons golf events division merged together uh, to form uh, to form what is now Outlier, uh, Tim Aronson and Andy Bush are the the company's two partners. Um, they have been in the golf space for years and years and years, and I don't think they're. I, I mean, they between the two of them, they know everybody in the golf business. Um, that's that's kind of one of the things that I've that I've just joked with. That's I mean, they know everybody. So um, with these two events. Uh, the the deal in Plan LA Open and the JM Eagle LA Championship presented by Plast Pro. It's it, it's it's really it's really cool for us to be doing uh, to be managing these two events in uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, at Nikki, as you mentioned, we did three last year uh, with the with the Meta Heel Championship last fall at uh, at Satakoy. But it's when, when I when I was at Golf Channel and uh, and the the then Hugel Air Premia LA Open uh, was announced in 2018 uh, and coming to Wilshire Country Club. That was the first LPGA event coming back to Los Angeles in probably 13, 13 years or so. Right. It's and so and I know that when Mike was was commissioned the LPGA, that Los Angeles was a big initiative for him and his team. And because it's it's Los Angeles. Right. And and when this got announced back in 2018, I helped on the on the television side, helped to announce this as well. We we came up with, we all came up with this hashtag LPGA goes Hollywood, and and we have uh, we have used that kind of ever since. I I, I joked with folks that uh, about this when when it started. It's almost similar to in in Los Angeles when the NFL was not in LA for years and years and years, and 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 people thought okay how come the NFL doesn't have a football team, right? <laughs> Same thing on the golf, on the golf side. How come there's not a professional golf event in Los Angeles? And, uh, and so this year we've got two of them. Last year we had two events back to back. Uh, and this year they're spread out uh, a, a month apart. So the deal in plan LA open, uh, which is going to be at Palos Verdes, uh, March 30th through April 2nd. Uh, it's actually the fifth year of this tournament and the first year at Palos Verdes. Uh, Palos Verdes hosted, an LPJ event last year, the Palos Verdes Championship, presented by Bank of America, um, and it was a, a hugely successful event. So the DO Implant LA Open in the past, the, the past few years, was at Wilshire Country Club. That tournament moved over to Palos Verdes for uh, a, a an inaugural event. Uh, so JM Eagle LA Championship presented by Plaspro. So uh, JM Eagle and Plaspro, they are two LA-based companies uh, that are title and presenting sponsor of, uh, of this event at Wilshire Country Club, the end of April. And the CEOs and founders of, uh, of both JM Eagle and Plasper, Walter and Shirley Wang, we, they are just, they're golf fans. They, they, are, they are pure 100% golf fans. We did a press conference with them at Wilshire Country Club last uh last October and just listening to them talk about their passion um, and, and what they want to do and how they want to grow women's sports and how they want to grow the LPGA tour. It was for all of us. It, it was a, it, it was a just, 
it, it, it was something, it was something else. We had Natalie Golbus there um, on behalf of the LPGA and she was listening to Walter and Shirley speak. And she said in the press conference that I have done a lot of these over the years. I have never heard anybody speak with as much passion about coming up with it, with a new, with starting a new tournament than Walter and Shirley. And there, you know, it's, it's, uh, I, I wish Mike was on, was on to hear this because w- when I was with him, uh, for you, I, I I sat in a number of his press conferences over the years, and he would uh, he would focus on a lot of things, but he would always focus. He would say check writers, right? He would focus on on the sponsors. That that was one of his really big initiatives as his as his time as commissioner. Um, and JM Eagle and uh, and Plaspro, they are uh, they're doing just that with uh, with this tournament at Washington Country Club at the end of April. Um, the purse is going to be three million dollars, um, which is one of the largest on the LPGA tour outside of the majors. Um, so that is from from an LPGA player standpoint, it's huge. Uh, on the the DON Plant LA Open side uh, at Palos Verdes, that one that purse this year is uh, one point seven five, and it's a two hundred two hundred fifty thousand dollar increase over last year. So that's I think for all of us that's what we're trying to, that's what we're trying to help with. Right. And I think that's, that's what we're, we're, it, it's, we run, uh, we run several events on the LPGA tour and, and we hear it a lot and we, we want to, you know, it's, it's the, we want to get a balance, right. And, and increase the, in, increase the parity, right. Um, increase the balance between the, the PGA tour and the LPGA tour. So, uh, that's a long winded part about, uh, kind of about the, the background and, and these two tournaments um no, happy to dive that. in a little bit more about about the events so. yeah from a from a fan standpoint you know we're, we're super excited especially after unfortunately losing to you know longtime southern california events the the kia classic at at aviara and then of course the the ana inspiration out in the desert so uh, yeah. it's great to have um have you know the tour back and, and especially in la so we look forward to it we appreciate from a section standpoint working alongside you all we've got some promotions going, some VIP yep. experiences. We're going to do some cool things with kids and um, yep. practice rounds with pros and, and things of that nature. Why don't you talk just a little bit before we wrap it up, Jeremy? On I know you're bringing it. We're bringing back a legend out of retirement, Judy Rankin. Is she going to be covering? Uh, is it Palos Verdes or yes? Or both? So uh, yes, yeah, so she is. Um, so we we did a uh, a media Zoom conference call uh, on Wednesday with. Andrea Lee, Lizette Salas, uh, and Judy Rankin, and uh, Jim Gormley uh, was was on, and he uh, he 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 hopped on. Uh, I, I brought him in halfway through uh, with uh, to talk about Palos Verdes as well. So Judy is uh, for the the DOM Plan LA Open at Palos Verdes. She's going to be the lead analyst in the broadcast booth uh, that week. So she joked uh, with me prior, uh, and she joked on the call. She said that she's she is full time retired, but she is a she's a fill in uh, when when and she's a sub when need be. The, well, the cool not, part not about, a bad sub. <laughs> yeah, no, not a bad sub at all. And the cool part about that um, with this tournament, uh, the LA Open that that week, um, women's golf is going to be taking center stage because you have you have the the DOM Plan LA Open on the LPGA Tour, and then that same week you also have the Augusta National Women's Amateur. And, and it's, it's for us, uh, I think for, for us on the, on the professional side, um, it's as, as Mike talked about with, uh, you know, with, with the U S women's open coming to pebble and, and being on NBC and having young, having young girls watch, that's our goal also for that week. And that's, that's what we're working with, with you guys, um, on, on kind of generating awareness and is, is to get, you know, is to get those young fans and get those young girls, you know, in, uh, just really in, interested in, into the game. And with us being the same week as the Augusta National Women's Amateur, it's really cool for us. It's it's us showcasing women's sports um, yeah. kind of at the forefront. That's awesome. Thank you. We look, we look forward to, to watching Lizette and Andrea and, and so many of our other Southern California junior alumni. So thanks, Jeremy, for, for your time. Thanks for all you're doing for these events. We're, we're looking forward to, to seeing you soon. Yep, and and also uh, on that front, uh, with uh, for all for all of y'all on, on the call. So, uh, to we we would love we we love to to see y'all come out to our uh, to our events. Uh, show your 
uh, your PJ membership card and you will get complimentary admission to uh, to both tournaments. Awesome. Thank you. And, and Lynn just reminded me that you, you all will be moving north um, a little bit later in the year at Harding Park. So that's exciting news as well. A lot, yep. uh, a lot of golf in California this year. Pretty exciting. Yep. There is. Yes. Awesome. Well, thanks, Jeremy, for joining us and we'll, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. No. Thank you, guys. Appreciate yeah. it. All good, Nikki. Thank you. Yeah, Craig, Craig is all yours this time. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Craig, you've got um, 14 minutes. I'm just kidding. Please update us on, on what's going on and what we should be paying attention to and, and uh, be educated on, if you would, please. Well, Len said it earlier, golf uses a lot of land and we and it uses a lot of water, although not nearly as much water as most people think. And that's part of our challenge to educate them. So I'm going to talk about land and water and how both intersect with public policy and affect the golf community. I'm going to start with water. Um, boy, we have a record snowpack in California. Uh, right now, water managers are letting water out of the reservoirs, which, uh, which not that many weeks ago, we're getting near Deadpool status and, and critically low. But that's how volatile uh, the weather can be. And that's how volatile the state water project is in, in California. And, and volatility is really the, the hallmark. We can become in desperate straits when we have three straight dry years like we did the previous three years. And then that can all fill up. And that's wonderful. That means that the state water project is going to let the water flow. Um, the, the other day, the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California called off the, the emergency that we went under on June 1st last year. And by the way, part of, part of involved in that emergency order and those 35% cutbacks was the Los Angeles Country Club, the site of the 2023 US Open. And I know there's been a lot of focus and I personally spent a lot, of my, a lot of time working with that. And I think they were all set to go from level three drought to level four drought and put on a magnificent championship. And they've been bailed out. We're likely to go to some version of level two drought, which will take even less pressure off uh, than there is now. And Los Angeles Country Club and literally every other golf course within those regions, almost every other golf course, a couple struggled in some hot zones but they managed to get through it. That's the good news. But that good news, and I, I mention it up front because everyone knows that, everyone feels it, everyone gets a little bit frustrated. Why are we still called putting ourselves in a declared drought? Well, we're out of the declared drought. However, there is that other source of imported water for California, for Southern California anyway, called the Colorado Basin. And uh, as uh, someone who I met with at the PGA meetings, and you met too, Nikki, the other day, Jeff Lessig from Arizona pointed out, 20 incredible years in a row won't solve the problem in the Colorado Basin. And to the degree to which that's a significant amount of the a significant source of the imports for the southern part of the state, including the Coachella Valley, that's going to continue to be an ongoing problem. For those who don't know, California is in a bit of a tug of war and a posturing game right now with its fellow states in the Colorado Compact as to how we're all going to agree to give up between two and four million acre feet permanently of allocation off the Colorado River. And yes, California has senior rights and California has um, all kinds of rights under the law, the river over Arizona, Nevada, and virtually every other state. However, the reality is the river that's allocated at 17 million acre feet per year that generates 12 to 13 million acre feet in a good year. And that's an amount that's declining with each year. You do the math and something has to give. And that even means for California. And for the first time, truly, it means something in the Coachella Valley. And the hardest thing is getting the attention of the golf community in the Valley because previous efforts to sort of scold them a little bit on some of their ways really amounted to crying wolf because they knew, we knew, anyone in the golf industry knew it wasn't reality. It was political reality, but not water-based, not water supply reality. But this time it really is. Some of that allocation, which has always been unlimited off the Colorado River, is going to be seeded, whether it's this year or next year, who knows how long the negotiations will take, but that's the reality moving forward. So there's always that problem in the backdrop. If next year, 
uh, ec isn't a, a solid uh, precipitation year, we could be back to where we started, uh, you know, a few months ago. So keep that in mind. And that's why even though, mo even though we're on flood watch throughout the state, everyone is admonishing all of us to be water wise and efficient moving forward and something, we, something we've continued to do. The same dynamic applies, that applies in the Colorado Basin, that applies with water, that applies with the state water project, applies with uh, Sacramento, with the legislative calendar. Len mentioned what he did because earlier this morning, both he and Nikki were on a, a legislative check-in of the California Alliance for Golf, when in essence, all of the discussion, other than our plans for Capital Day later this month on March 29th, all of the discussion was about land bills, housing bills really, and all kinds of changes to the Surplus Land Act, which affects golf's hold, particularly municipal golf's hold on the open spaces we need to apply our game and to grow it and to diversify it over time. But in addition, on the other side, also water. What they all have in common, what, what, the, what the water legislation in Sacramento has in common, and much of it is just the opening of a conversation, what the land bills or the housing bills have in common with the water bills, which has in common with the discussion going on in the Colorado Basin right now, is all those old arrangements, whether in the Colorado Basin we talk about pre-1914 water, senior water rights, riparian rights, that's a complicated subject I won't go into, or all of those arrangements that amount to giving priorities various forms of priorities to California and those who stuck their straw on the ground first as opposed to last. Those things are a good starting point for these discussions, but the end point is going to be some form of undoing all of it as we move forward, because every one of these issues, those of you who read the Los Angeles Times, there's a great article today, it discusses much of what went on in Sacramento this last week in terms of hearings about bills uh, involving the crunch on student housing. I, it's an astronomical number of students, particularly at the University of California, but also the state university system that have nowhere to live and no prospects and many years of effort to build more student housing uh, have failed. I think probably the most notable is the environmental suit against the, against the University of California in, in Berkeley's in, in a desire to build much needed student housing and it's been stopped by, uh, by the Environmental Quality Act. All of those things taken together it, it are, you know, militate in strong favor of really upending so many of those old arrangements and those old laws. The golf community is tracking every one of those bills because to one degree or another, they affect golf. Again, we use a lot of land, we use a lot of water, uh, although we use less and less water over time. And I think, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, sorry for coughing in your, in your ears. And I, I, and I would have to um, say that uh, there are aspects that we watch. There could, be, there could be edges around which we may trim and be involved. The good news is there is no bill in the hopper at this particular point like, like we faced in the last, well, last few years. There's no, there's no more legislation on independent contracting. I know this is a crowd of PGA professionals primarily, and that affected you in the industry more than anybody else. We came out of that smelling pretty much like a rose, which is fairly remarkable because that's not been the case in some of the other states in the union. Um, so there's something to be said about the apparatus we have available to deal with what I think everyone understands is probably a more difficult political atmosphere to work those kinds of issues. So we should pat ourselves, I think, on the back a little bit for a good performance in that regard. But there's no AB 672, there's no AB 1910. There are no direct shots at the golf community that are not, there are things which may affect every employer in the state or every user of open space or turf in the state, but we're not alone in that. We are, and particularly when it becomes, we have other allies in those fights and quite honestly allies and, and, and stakeholders who have infinitely more political clout and power than we do, which is why the defeats of Sec 72 and 1910 were all the more remarkable because we were all alone. There was method to targeting golf and only targeting golf. It was a, an assumption on behalf of those who targeted us that we were politically disorganized and, and weak. Um, I think we showed 
that we we were a little bit they weren't quite that and quite honestly we surprised them because we took we took advantage of something that we never had before and for that reason they didn't understand it and shame on us for not understanding it but almost three and a half million people play golf in this state and i think we finally came to the moment where when push comes to shove we need to engage those three and a half million who have a passion for the game not just the superintendents and the gms and the golf professionals and the manufacturers of the, of the equipment that we buy those are financially you're all financially interested parties and you may have much more stake in the game but at the end of the day when you're talking about the 1910s and the 672s of our universe that affected a couple of million people who just play golf on the weekends or during the week if they do if they're lucky enough and enjoy the game and so forth so we'll keep that mess we'll keep that message in mind we're not entirely organized to tap that uh, we did it we did it on we did it on the fly last year and ultimately I, whether we were lucky or good I, I don't know the difference and the same thing with playing golf and maybe maybe the Gary Player's statement comes to you know face saying comes to mind the more I practice the luckier I get so maybe we ought to take that moving forward as well. We're tracking those things. We're working on those things. Uh, we'll try to make all of you cognizant of, of those particular issues and engage you when we can engage you. And I'll simply close with, um, and I've been a little bit, I've been a little bit vague because we're in the process of really diving in to analyze those many bills, keeping in mind two things. Um, bills can be amended. And we have to, we, and, 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 and 2,600 bills were filed. Some have a lot of legs and are very serious and are often, uh, often refinements of bills that didn't quite make it in previous years. And we take those more seriously because their authors take them more seriously. Then there are the bills that are a little bit more performative. Uh, they're the kinds of bills that legislators file because they're trying to make happy a stakeholder or a constituency in their own district or maybe some of their political backers to show them how much they love them and how much they care about it. but they but they're, they understand what we may what we have to understand is they're they're highly unlikely to go anywhere in this particular session and, and we don't want to spend a lot of time focusing attention on things that go nowhere we want to focus attention on things that are going somewhere but pay attention to those things because the thing, those bills that aren't going anywhere this year might become law five years from now. And we don't want to wait until four or five years from now to address them. So we're paying attention to those things. We're going to go through those things. Final comment. I'm encouraged. I just came back from PGA of America meetings and um, I was at the National Golf Course Owners Association business conference of, in January. Uh, work we everyone knows we've been working with the golf course superintendents association for years and i'm seeing a genuine coming together of all those organizations so instead of wasting instead of creating a little bit of waste with the limited resources we have in the advocacy realm by working in silos i'm seeing that we're all increasingly working together working together on educational conferences i've made conscious efforts when i'm invited to make presentations to before an organization to bring a Mike Lee or a Ronnie Miles from other organizations to that. Behind the scenes and a little bit quietly, Mike Wan's off the telecast right now. The USGA is around the edges. Uh, there are those trying to push it into the same space, maybe not in the same way. Everyone has their different, their different place in the industry and they have a different culture and a different constituency. And there's nothing wrong with that. Together, we're actually much stronger not weaker. And I think uh, if the USGA can be brought to bear to play with the rest of us the way the rest of us are, are doing these things. When I say the rest of us, I've spent my entire golf career in that particular family. So this is really important to me, that family of the USGA and the amateur golf associations. And yet, and yet that maybe makes me painfully aware that I have closer relationships with all the others than I have with the one that's ostensibly I'm part of the family. And that probably speaks volumes about the need to bring that organization into, the, in, into, into this great family with the rest of us. So on many counts, I know, and I said this earlier in, in the legislative call, it's my job to play the role of Jeremiah or Cassandra, depending on which, uh, you know, which you prefer, 
to point out all those dangers, all those things that are out there that I see because of what I do every day for a living and to make, make golf aware of them. So I, I'm aware I can come across as the spreader of bad news and negative. That's my job. The way in which you can get out in front of bad news and solve problems and become an eternal optimist like me is first recognizing the problem in its earliest stages and begin working to address it. In having said all that, yes, on the other hand, I think in all respects, things are moving, at least in, in the advocacy realm and probably other realms as well, I'm just not as knowledgeable, are moving in a very positive direction and a very collaborative direction. We still have a long way to go, but I think on this count, I'll say the same thing that I've often said of golf's record in water conservation. We have a very good record and we should be very, very proud of it in the last 20 years. But instead of wearing that as a laurel or something to stand to rest on, we should use it as giving ourselves and the rest of the world, the political world and the media world, the confidence that we, we should have and they should have that we can continue to do the same things we've done for the last 20 years, not to maintain that excellence, but to advance it even further and faster. And again, not as a feel good or do good proposition, but as, but as a survival proposition in being able to continue to be at least a thousand facilities strong in the state of California in year 2050. I hope for some growth, but, and I would say of what I've often said of our record in water conservation and environmental stewardship, I'll say of the same thing in advocacy. We've come a long way. It's not nearly long enough, but the fact that we've come to what we've done, when we are able to get through smelling like a rose on independent contracting in a pro-labor state, when we are able to defeat the 672s and the 1910s, when we are able to nibble around the edges and at least have audiences with the, with the water managers in this state and with the regulatory bodies, we should be proud of that record and then use it to understand that if we can simply keep figure out those things that made all of that work and double down on them and continue to do them on that realm, on that side of the equation as well, we'll continue to be a strong industry in 2050 uh, and, and even beyond. So I'll echo, so I'll, I'll echo Mike Wan a little bit. I'm even older, and I don't know if I'm crabbier than he is. I'll leave that the judgment to others, but I am older than he is. That, that's a fact. And I would say the same thing uh, that uh, 2050 might not is not in my future, but I think all of us every day that we wake up need to be thinking about the game and the industry in 2050 and 2080 and and uh, even 2200 or whatever. That's that really sounds strange. 2200 moving forward. So let's keep up the good work. Let's not put our heads in the sand. Let's not uh, you know say it's the best of all possible worlds. And let's understand that the real optimists among us are those who, who, under, who, who recognize, acknowledge, and deeply try to understand our biggest problems. And then our optimism is born of the fact that we think we have the power to do something about them. With that, I think I spoke for 18 minutes, Nikki. I apologize. But how many years have you known me? And you've got to think of four years, four minutes over is like really a good performance. It's, it's really like under. So thank you. It's, it's really under by two yeah. minutes. Yeah. yeah. No. Yes. Thanks, Craig. Great. That's Nikki, my thank sign you. off. <laughs> Greg, thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for being with us. Tremendous attendance today here on. Uh, uh, St. Patrick's Day. So as you heard, no shortage of the top players of the world being here in California this year, both both U.S. Opens, the men's and women's three LPA, LPGA tour events at Palos Verdes, Wilshire, and here at Harding Park. Also the U.S. Women's Amateur uh, as well. Just absolutely incredible. Uh, thank you all. Nikki, some closing comments? I think you summed it up perfectly, Lynn. Um, this was a, a great turnout. We had some unbelievable guests, uh, perfect timing for that. So big thanks to Mr. Addis for, uh, for lining up Mr. Juan. Uh, that worked out perfect. And uh, thanks to everyone for joining us and hope you have a, a, a dry, sunny and safe, happy St. Patrick's Day. Yeah, yeah, well said, Nikki, thank you. And, and to Mr. Juan, Mr. Friedman and Craig for being with us and Nikki to you and 
and our, our presidents, again, the reign of Eric's that we're going through at the moment to Steve Monday, to Bryce, Steve Rent to Shelby for putting this all together. As you said, everybody, uh, everybody stay safe, keep looking out for each other. And I think we said I think April 14th, right? Might be our next gig. I believe so. Yeah. Okay, stay tuned. We are working on uh Craig Kessler, the other Craig Kessler, uh, the uh, new chief operating officer for the PGA of America at a minimum. So best to everyone. Be safe, be happy, stay dry, and we'll see you in about a month. Thanks, everybody. Bye.